Luke, welcome back to the podcast, man. Well, thanks for having me again. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, so the last episode, we talked a lot about globalism, elitism, CBDC, social credit scores, etc. This episode, I want to focus more on privacy and privacy tools and I suppose how people can use them. Um, so let's kick it off. So obviously, crypto started with Bitcoin, right? So now that I think a lot of the lack of privacy problems on Bitcoin is sort of coming to fruition. Um, on the other side of that, Bitcoiners are sort of implementing more uh, private solutions. So for example, Lightning is uh, a lot more private than just normal Bitcoin transactions. So talk to me about uh, privacy on Lightning, privacy on coin joins, um, the ups, the downs. Do you think they work in general and do they scale to 8 billion people? Um, I would say no. Um... I mean, the thing to say about, firstly, coin joins, that's a more obvious example. I think, I mean, coin joins have a miserable, an onset, and um, they're, I wouldn't even say they give you privacy. I would say maybe they give you, like, legal, plausible deniability, maybe, um, but I, I mean, they're so infrequently used, and when they are, they're, they're just not very powerful for what they're supposed to do. I would almost, like, totally dismiss them as being uh, an issue. Um, now, Lightning, I suppose you can say is good for privacy. Um, I, I will just say that, I mean, Lightning itself is just software that is theoretically irrelevant to Bitcoin. I mean, saying that Lightning is good for privacy is kind of like saying like Coinbase is good for privacy because you're not really transacting on the Bitcoin network. You're using some other system. Now, that's not me saying Lightning is the same thing as Coinbase. Obviously, it's not. It's not a, a, a custodial system and it's, it's much better. Um, I, I think the complaint that I've had about Bitcoin as compares to Monero is, you know, Bitcoin, obviously, one of the foundational assumptions of Bitcoiners, and there's a reason they, they have this, but um, one of their foundational assumptions is that we are not going to hard fork, we're not going to make any significant changes uh, to Bitcoin. And that makes it very difficult to fix principled issues uh, in it. And therefore, it by necessity requires you to rely on other systems like Lightning. And the issue with that is that all the stuff you build on top of Bitcoin, if you want it to still be worth using, it has to retain all of the same benefits of Bitcoin. It has to still be decentralized. It has to still be free software. It has to still be you know, custodial and, and all this kind of stuff. And that actually is very much an uphill battle. It really is like reinventing Bitcoin for every layer you add on it. You need a lot of harebrained schemes to do all this kind of stuff. And, um, and it, it honestly is just kind of nasty and inefficient. I, I think there's a, uh, there's a, I guess, aesthetic disgust I have at, at the idea. Now, I understand the, the modularity um, aspect of it, but um, I would just say that using Lightning... It doesn't give you privacy on Bitcoin. It's just a, a system outside of Bitcoin that isn't on the blockchain. I mean, that could be anything, right? That could be you, you writing, um, you know, transaction hashes on your uh, on a piece of paper. You know what I mean? Um, so can it scale? I think there are a lot of issues in Lightning that, uh, I mean, the biggest ones are there's still an ability to lock up funds and stuff like this. Like you can attack lightning in a way that is, is kind of easy. Um, and I would say that's a big issue. And I think even bigger than that, a lot of Bitcoiners have kind of, they've settled on lightning as, ah, oh, this is going to be the panacea. When in reality, I mean, how many people actually use this? I mean, a legitimate question, not many, barely any. That's just how it is. It's really technology that's still in its infancy. I mean, not to say that Bitcoin isn't in its infancy itself, but uh, Lightning is just like so scarcely used. Even with its benefits, it is much less used than, you know, the Bitcoin layer that it's on top of. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's, I suppose, one variable. Things obviously grow with time, as you mentioned. Um, but some things that don't change and things that I like to focus on more are things that are set in stone. So you talked about attacking Lightning. Um, break it down as if I'm five. How do you do that? Um, well, I mean, because you have to basically put up your funds, you know, you, you open up channels and stuff like that. Um, you can kind of, there are different ways of you lot when other people's funds, they have opened up channels. There are ways of you locking up by creating, you know, dummy transactions and stuff like that. Um, there are ways for you basically to keep their money out in limbo doing nothing. 
uh, just ways of attacking the network. And this is all of this is the same. Now, I, I have full hope that this will be fixed, right? I have all, that all of these issues are going to be slowly fixed. But that the issue that I said before is the Lightning Network or any other system is just reinventing the wheel at every stage. And there's a point where you have to ask, why don't we just like, why don't we just modify the original state of it? Like, why don't we don't have these privacy issues? Why don't we just try and alleviate them at the bare bones system of it? And that, of course, is what Monero does. Like, Monero has built in hard forks, uh, regularly regularly scheduled things. Um, and that, I think, is, and now there's, there's a, a degree of trust involved in that. You have to trust that the Monero team is not going to screw things up, um, I, I guess you could say. But... It is. It does at least give them the ability to improve things, and I think that's uh, that is uh, something beneficial. I want to take it back for a second because it's got me thinking. Um, I mean, ideologically, why why are you interested in privacy? Are you just, I suppose, a libertarian? Um, do you think it's? I mean, you, you answer the question. I'm just curious. Oh uh, well, I would definitely not describe myself as a libertarian. I think that um, I, I've said before, I'm not really as interested in personal privacy um that is and th frankly this is how most people are most people when you really push comes to shove they don't actually really care about privacy they don't really care if some company knows all this stuff about them and i know that they feel that way because they they're obviously acting in a way consistent with that what people do care about and what i care about in this case is i care about systemic privacy and that is if i live in a world where for example there's all of this public metadata about all of these people that a corporation or a government can use. Well, that means, as, as we talked about in our previous episode, right, that means that a social engineer can say, okay, I'm going to design an algorithm or design an AI or these other things that can look at this mass trove of data. And I can, you know, I'm going to put in, maybe I'll start with targeted advertising um, and it'll move to things that are even more pernicious than that. Uh, where people are being controlled in a very systematic way. So when you have technology that is just leaking privacy information all over the place, it's just dangerous. You don't know what's going to happen there. And more importantly, if you are designing a technology from the top down, why would you, I mean, if you had the choice creating a cryptocurrency, do I want to make it private or do I want to make every single transaction public information to anyone? Only a psychopath would say the second one. Now, the only reason Bitcoin has that is just because it's an accident of its architecture. But if now that we have technology that can alleviate that, it seems silly to go with the, the older system. And speaking of technology that can alleviate that, um, I know you've advocated for ZK proofs um, to be put on Monero instead of ring signatures. So ZK proofs. Now, I've tried looking at this in a superficial level, right? <laughs> yeah, um, right. A lot of the a lot of the content you find online is uh, pretty sophisticated with the maths and how they explain it. Maybe I'm just not finding the right content. But explain yeah. it to me like I'm five. So, well, I mean, you, you've heard like the Alibaba's cave metaphor. You familiar with that? In me. Oh, okay, okay. So Alibaba's cave. This, this is like when they were first introduced. This is like the metaphor that kind of explains them. So suppose there's this guy Alibaba. And he has a, a he has a little store, and a thief comes and steals something from his you know shop, and the thief runs into this cave. Okay, so how the cave works is it looks like this. There are like two. You can go into the cave, and there are two paths you can take, and they don't connect to each other, but they're very close on the other end. Okay, so the thief goes in. So Alibaba has seen the thief goes go in here, and he knows that the thief went through one of the path paths. Okay, so he says, okay, maybe he went on the right path. I'll go on the right path as well, and I'll try and run into him. But he doesn't see him. He runs out, and he realizes, oh, I went the wrong path. He came out the other way, right? Makes sense? So then the thief does this again and again. So the next day he comes, he steals something. They go back to Alibaba's cave. Alibaba decides, maybe I'll go to the left this side. Maybe I'll go to the right again. Either way, he realizes, oh, I haven't found him. And this, if this goes on for months and months and months, Alibaba mathematically knows something, and that is he knows there's something weird about this cave. So, and Alibaba, you know, tries to study the cave, and he realizes, oh, these two uh, legs of the cave, the, these, you know, parts of the cave, they actually, there's a secret door that connects them. And so what the thief is actually doing is he's going down whichever side, and when he hears Alibaba come up, he goes through the secret door and he escapes the other end, all right? So what you've just seen is a, a zero knowledge proof, okay? So Alibaba um, 
Uh, so what we've decided, the thief knows something. He has a secret. He has the equivalent of a private key, okay? He has this ability to math, to transport be between these two cave sides. Uh, and we know that because statistically speaking, we can keep going in the cave and he will always give the, he will always escape. He will always go out the other end, right? So mathematically, this is just what's happening more or less in a zero knowledge proof uh, where you don't reveal someone your private key, but you, you with mathematical certainty, um, you know, using typical elliptic, well, not typical, but, you know, uh, cryptography, um, you can show that I'm not going to tell you what this key is, but I'm going to prove to you in this statement, in the same way the thief did, that I have the ability to use it without showing you what that actually is. And that's just kind of the, the five-year-old explanation of what a zero knowledge proof is, right? It's you showing someone else that you have this knowledge without actually telling you what the knowledge is. It's very interesting. Even simpler example of a zero knowledge proof. Suppose you have a friend who's colorblind. You know, he's red, green, colorblind, and you have a red ball and a green ball. Suppose he doesn't believe that there is actually a difference between red and green and everyone is pulling his leg. Well, what you can tell him to do is hold the balls and then put them behind his back and maybe switch them around, maybe not. And then he will, you will always be able to identify which one the red is. And you could statistically prove to him that you can actually see the colors. And that would prove, that is a zero knowledge proof. That is you showing him that, oh, well, I don't see the difference between these, but this guy clearly understands the secret that defines which one is which, right? So that's pretty much where my understanding was at. So the ability to prove something without actually re revealing the secret, right? How right. do you do that on in a mathematical sense? How do you do that for transactions? Um, you want me to like get out elliptic curves at this point or well, something? So this is where I'm at, right? So this is every time I, I do like the deep dive on YouTube, that's pretty much where I become unstuck because it becomes pretty advanced cryptography. Is, is there a way to explain it in a, a simpler way? You're gonna have you're gonna have to start reading some white papers. That's what I'll tell you. Uh, nothing that I could, uh, I mean, if I had a PowerPoint, maybe we, we could go into it, but uh, Hey, I don't know anything about it. Uh, well, I don't know everything about it. I should say. So, um, that, that is for those watching, that is your first step into zero knowledge proofs. Um, you you can look up, uh, different white papers and different writings on it. Well, of which there are many. I mean, the nice thing about people working in cryptography is most of these public, these papers are public. Um, uh, so they do require some math knowledge, but the intuition behind them is just the metaphor that I've just showed you writ large on an, on an elliptic curve where you can, um, you know, basically draw a line through a curve and given, you know, the private key information, you can always get a set output, right? Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's, I guess that has to be homework for your viewers, I suppose. <laughs> Sure. I might have even jumped the gun earlier. So we spoke about uh, privacy on Lightning and coin joins. Then we jumped into, I suppose, ZK proofs, but Monero, right? Right. What problems do you think Monero solves in general? Um, um, what, it, what it solves, you said? Yeah, like why why Monero, basically? Uh, well, I mean, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of reasons. I mean, Monero, as it is right now, is just the only cryptocurrency out there of any decent usage that keeps user privacy secret. Um, it's not perfect technology. It has some issues, so it has some areas where it can improve. Um, but as I said before, firstly, Monero is prone. In fact, it's capable of improving. You do have scheduled hard forks that are you know, watched over by the community. Uh, and so privacy improvements, and there have been many. Monero, when it first started, was actually kind of junky. I mean, it was kind of a proof of concept. The ring signatures were not required. That is, privacy was not required. Um, and that actually decreases the an onset. That makes things more difficult. Um, but Monero has added so many things as time has gone on um, to make it more... Uh, I mean, it, right? it's just frankly, it, ha it does the most of... It, it's the best of basically every world in crypto. It's private. It has low transaction fees. Um, it is ASIC resistant to some degree. Um, again, it has community hard forks and there are a lot of people, as people have probably noted, um, there are a lot of developers working on it. So I would just say there's a constellation of different things that make Monero kind of above the others. And obviously it does have a good bit more, I mean, the reality of cryptocurrency as it's being used online 
is Monero is highly overrepresented in people who are actually doing things with cryptocurrency, which is a small market, mind you. But, you know, Monero is kind of not quite the only game in town, but it's Bitcoin and Monero. And then everything else is just kind of, you know, for fun, you know. So as a privacy tool, as a monetary tool, like where do you think Monero is going in society? Do you think it's going to be adopted by most people or what's your thesis? Uh, well, that would be, it, it has to happen one step at a time. And I also think it shouldn't be any, no technology should be adopted by people who don't need it. Um, and as it is right now, um, well, I could say that a lot of normal people could use it because we are transacting digitally a lot, even in real life. But I think it's going to start first where it is already, and that is doing online transactions. You can buy server space and other stuff with Monero. Obviously, people know that uh, you know people buy drugs online and illegal stuff because it has uh, some privacy, or at least allegedly people say that. I don't know if there's like some you know reason for it. Um, so I, I think it's going to be slow adoption. But again, like the cryptocurrency market, the reality is, and this is the in and out of bear and bull markets should prove to you the fact that basically most of the people talking about cryptocurrency, they're not actually using it. And so the actual adoption is going to be very, very slow. In fact, the, the use of Monero uh, as it is right now in this bear market is probably much more accurate than it would be in other times and places. And I think there also is a reason that Monero people can correctly note that even during this bear market, Monero is performing comparatively well. It's actually gained a good bit on Bitcoin. Um, now, that might not continue. I, I mean, a lot of other factors go into that. But I would just say that it's going to be a slow adoption. You're not, I wouldn't expect to see your grandma using it anytime soon. But um, that's it, ha it happens one step at a time as more people get into it. Now, the biggest issue for Monero right now is uh, how do you get it? How, hey, could you tell me how to get Monero? Like this is uh, for us, we know about it for people who have cryptocurrency or have Bitcoin already, but how are you going to get your grandma to do it? Literally the path of least resistance would be signing grandma up for a KYC exchange, buying, you know, Bitcoin or Litecoin and then swapping it on some random site for Monero. Okay. And at that point you already have KYC. What's the point? So that's the hurdle right now, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and when people ask me, oh, wow, you talk about Monero, how can I get it? It's hard for me to say, oh, here's this foolproof way of easily getting it without KYC because it often requires them using, uh, you know, local Monero or BISC or one of these things that sounds creepy because it's like Craigslist and I might, you know, transact with some weirdo, right? So I think the onboarding people, that's kind of the difficult thing right now. Interesting, interesting. Um, a bigger question too is, do you think, uh, you said that people take the path of least resistance. Monero is obviously hard to get. We talked about CBDC's uh, globalism in the last episode. So in that case, what do you think is going to happen to Bitcoin? Uh, I think Bitcoin is going to continue to be what it is now. And that is like a useless index fund. Um, so like people will buy Bitcoin and it will go up and they don't really use it for much. I mean, it's like this theoretical thing. And I, if, if it hasn't happened already, I'm sure it will happen in the future that the vast majority of people, I mean, this is definitely already true, but the vast majority of people who use Bitcoin are KYC'd up the wazoo. Um, so it totally defeats the point of even having the thing. Um, so it really is just an index fund that's indexed to the price of Bitcoin. That's it. Like that's when people say that they own Bitcoin, that's what they mean. They have an account on um, you know, Gemini or Coinbase or something where they have this pretend Bitcoin. Um, so that's really where I see that going. And that's another little benefit of Monero because Monero is like not fully blacklisted from exchanges, but it's kind of like more of a, oh, wow, it's private. That's a, like suspicious. So it's less on centralized exchanges, which is a good thing. Um, if you have Monero, if anyone have, has Monero on a centralized exchange, I don't know what is going through your head right now. I don't know what to say about that, um, but it could be a, a private wallet or if you have anything on a centralized exchange. But um, so, yeah, Bitcoin is, is kind of useless right now. I think maybe in the future, if there's some great lightning technology, maybe people will start using it for something in, in the proper way, like as custodians of their own funds. But I'm not very optimistic about that, to be honest. And I think the El Salvador situation with the kind of mess of the 
adoption there and, you know, all this kind of bad software. I think that's a great, you know, example. Yep. So I, I'm in El Salvador at the moment, actually, which is uh, evident with the newspaper behind me. Yeah. Um, yeah, most people aren't using it here, but I, I wouldn't say it's completely failed. Like, um, yeah. it's still early days, so I suppose we'll yeah, see. Well, but. Again, El Salvador, I think, is a great example because the government gave this path of least resistance to people where you get on the government custodial app where you don't have your private keys and you get the free Bitcoin from there and you have to use it. You actually, the thing I said about China before, um, where China was creating these CBDCs where you have to spend this money in some certain way. Well, El Salvador actually did that with Bitcoin on fake Bitcoin on their custodial exchanges or their custodial app where they said, well, you have to use this to buy some certain thing. You can't really transfer it to a private wallet. So I think that's a really good example. I mean, I, I think it's great that uh, Bitcoin is legal tender there, but um, you always got to remember that like people are going to do the easiest thing. Um, and uh, most of these people just have no clue like what Bitcoin is supposed to be about. I don't know if the president of El Salvador has any clue. I, I don't know. It, it might just be an index fund for him uh, with some pleasantries about, I don't know, new financial system. But I think if he were really a good ideologue, for Bitcoin and for, you know, cryptocurrency, uh, he would not have done any of this the way that he has. And I find it very suspicious. It's either ignorance or I don't, I don't know. I don't know what it is. So before we jump into um, just general privacy, privacy tools, what, what to you would mean that Monero has failed? What would you need to see to take place? That Monero has failed? Well, I'll tell you the most likely thing to cause Monero to fail or Bitcoin to fail um, it I, is actually a good failure. Um, and I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about like the world ending or like the internet going out or something. I'm more talking about the, of course, Bitcoin and Monero are both uh, proof of work currencies. Um, and of course there's proof of stake out there and you know, people are rightly suspicious of it, but you have to remember that like proof of work is like this weird game fair theoretic solution to solve the problem of like decentralized consensus, right? So the reason we have all these farms of servers that are mining Bitcoin or Monero um, is because this is just this weird scheme that Satoshi developed um, where we can get, we, we don't need a centralized custodian or decider to say how, you know, what is a real transaction or not. Um, so I think the, the, I could foresee, in fact, I might even go so far as predict that as soon as we determine that there are other ways of doing this, um, that is a point which will cause Bitcoin and Monero to conclusively fail, or at least, I mean, at least Monero can have a hard fork and they can integrate this new technology or something. But what I mean by that is if you develop some kind of technology that has decentralized consensus without massive server farms, uh, and it's done elegantly in some unpredicted way, there's nothing in principle that makes that impossible. It just happens to be that mankind has figured out this one way of doing it. Um, but there are many others. I mean, the example that uh, I, th I think I used in like a uh, essay on my blog a while back is like, you know, the Incan Empire, right? They never invented the wheel for use in carriages and carts. They're a great empire spanning, you know, over many countries um, or what are now today countries, um, but they never invented the wheel. But even weirder than that, they actually did inv invent the wheel on little toys. So they used them in children's toys, but they never thought, oh, we could put this on a, a cart. And you might say that, oh, well, that's kind of oblivious of them, but we might be in exactly the same circumstance where there is a very easy and concise way of getting decentralized consensus um, that doesn't need like server farms and stuff. Um, that's right under our nose and it's going to be, I don't know, some genius cryptographer or 16 year old kid. I don't know. Someone's going to figure it out and we're going to feel like idiots because we didn't think about it before. Um, so that I think is the most likely way, you know, barring apocalypse that Monero will fail. Do you, do you not think that CPU mining is the whole purpose of that? What do you mean? Like figuring out consensus in a much more distributed way. So obviously one CPU per person versus the centralized ASIC model. Well, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. I'm talking about like, you know, doing proof of work, like doing the, you know, hashing a bunch of stuff. It doesn't matter if it's ASICs or CPU. It's, it's the same thing. I'm talking about 
Like, I mean, j just as a point of comparison, so there's one... Um, I mean, proof of stake is a good example because it, it's a way of, of getting something kind of equivalent using a totally different mechanism. It's not to say I endorse proof of stake. Or there's, um, there's a cryptocurrency nano that has something that's kind of similar to proof of stake where they don't even have... And this, this is the reason why it would be so earth shattering. So nano is an example. They don't even need a blockchain. They have block lattices uh, where you basically have your... The, transaction history on your machine um, and everyone else has their own and they interact in a certain way. And it's, it's some kind of thing that's, I forget what they call it. It's like DPOS. I forget what the D stands for, but it's something maybe delegated proof of state. Delegated. Yeah. 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 Delegated. Uh, but th th that's not to endorse any of this, but that's just to say, think about that. If we had some kind of way of establishing that consensus in a reliable way, you wouldn't have to worry about blockchain size, okay? Because you just have your transaction history on your machine, right? There are a lot of things you don't have to worry about. The scalability issues, all this kind of junk, it just disappears into the ether. So that's what I'm talking about. So if, if you had someone realize a, a better way of doing this, yeah, that would make Bitcoin and Monero sound like utterly stupid. And again, like the, the benefit of Monero is you can have a hard fork where you integrate this new kind of technology, but... Um, that would it would totally change the way that we look at this. So let's talk about easy privacy tools for everybody. So any new person coming in, especially to something like Linux, right? There's oh man, there's thousands of different distros. Um, each of them do something slightly different. I mean, generally speaking, because I've been down the rabbit hole, and I'm I'm still by no means an expert on this. I'm not even close to an expert on the subject, and a lot of it's still confusing to even myself, who's put a lot of time into learning about Linux. So what's a good um, daily driver for uh, a Linux distro, I suppose? I think new users to Linux have a tendency to see all these different distributions and they kind of improperly assume that they're really that different when they really aren't. Like there are some, I, I, part of me wants to say anything is fine because the reality is they're really just specialized to the aesthetic purposes of the person designing them. Um, but the distribution that I use and I usually recommend is Artix Linux. And uh, now that's a derivative of Arch Linux. Now, Arch Linux itself, you have to install via the command line. There's no graphical interface. Artix Linux, you can do it that way. It comes with different desktop environments that you can use. And the reason I recommend that is there is an unfortunate tendency in some Linux distributions not to keep things simple. Um, and uh, Artix is, is more on the side of let's not let's not add things that users don't need. I mean, a lot of other distributions will try and add in all these different package managers and all this weird way of doing things. Um, Artix Linux, I usually install by the command line because I, I like to just have the stuff that I, I want and nothing more. But if you go to their website, they have many pre-configured pre desktop environments you can choose from. And again, I would just say, for introductory users, don't fret about the differences because the reality is you can install any of these desktop environments. And if you don't like it, you can change it. You can look up how to do that. Use the Arch Wiki, which has all the great information about how to do things. Um, so I would just say, don't sweat your decision, just go with whatever. And um, I, I mean, again, I, I recommend Artix, but um, cause it keeps it simple, but you know, anything's good ultimately. Anything is gonna be an improvement over what you're using, frankly, so. Sure. Um, so privacy tools, so like every single person, what do you think they are? How do you think like every person can improve their privacy as much as possible, as easily as possible? Well, the number one privacy tool is like using less tools. Uh, I mean, that's the biggest problem. Like, I don't think that um, it's so much. A lot of people have this idea that, oh, there's all the stuff I do on my phone. There's all the stuff I do on my computer and I need to find like free software equivalents or all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, open source equivalent, you know, all I think it's more asking yourself, do I really need this? That's step number one. And a lot of people are just getting themselves in privacy messes because uh, they just, I don't know, don't have impulse control when it comes to using technology. Um, that said, I mean, there are many sites you can look at, look them up that will list out um, lots of different free software to use. I mean, honestly, the things that I use on my computer, I mean, I guess I have Firefox, but I mean, Pretty much everything is free. Well, literally everything is free software. Um, it, I think it, it might be a difficult transition for people, but I would just say take it one step at a time and like get familiar with the, the new software you're using. 
Um, and start with, I would say like switch over software on your computer, like browsers and image editors or whatever you are using one by one. And then at the same time, use less web services. Um, this could be like Google drive or Dropbox, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that is really just an equivalent of like a USB drive, frankly, uh, that you could put on your keychain. Um, I think a lot of it is just, you know, and of course I was in a period in my life at many, many years ago where I, I used Google Drive. I didn't even have a computer at some point in my life. Um, and it's just not as hard as you might think to to extricate yourself from that. Um, I, I think people more need motivation than they do. The information is out there. The software is out there. People, It's just hard to change your kind of ingrained habits and just don't feel bad about working on that slowly. Um, I mean, I, it shouldn't take years and years to, to get to use all free software, but, you know, take it one step at a time, you know, a bit of a journey thing. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, there was a period when I first used Linux that I was switching through a whole bunch of programs, seeing what is the best for everything. And I've converged on the stuff that I use and I haven't changed anything in years to be honest at this point. So I mean, that's a natural process that happens and you know, that's good. So it's probably a bigger question. So I've thought it off the top of my head. Businesses are always looking for, I suppose, the most efficient, most cost effective, whatever rationality they might have for their solution, which often leads to like these big tech companies, right? So how do we, uh, how do employees, I suppose, get away, especially if you're forced to use something like Google Drive? For example, what I do, I'm, I have to upload to Google Drive. I have to download from Google Drive. How do I convince my boss not to use Google Drive? Yeah. Well, most people have trouble convincing their bosses because they don't try. So, uh, I mean, the the first thing, for, especially for people who are, who are working at like lower end, you know, not massive, or may, I don't know, maybe it's no business, no different for a massive business. But um, a lot of people just don't want to work up the courage to like say stuff like this to your boss, like, oh, let's use this software instead of that. Um, the reality is like a lot of corporate proprietary software is well advertised. And it's not actually better than the free software standard out there. And free software standards, universally, this is the thing to remember, universally, they integrate better with other technology because they're built to that. Whereas when you're using proprietary software that's violating your privacy anyway, that, that software is meant to be its own software package. You got to pay extra if you want to do this. You got to pay extra if you want to do that. Um, it, this, the incentives are very different where proprietary software is basically built to be annoying. Like it does the bare minimum and then it, it's made to be annoying. Whereas free software is made to integrate with other stuff. And so it's almost surprising to me when I, uh, I don't know, when I have to deal with someone's tech problems who has an iPhone or something like that, I don't even, I can't imagine how people put up with this kind of stuff because I'm so used at this point to using open standards. So I would be, I would say that's the case to make to your boss, like be knowledgeable about the technology and say, Hey, you know, uh, if we use this, uh, free software standard, um, this is, we, we could do this. We could integrate that. We could do all these kind of things. I can look at the source code. We, it has a config file. We can edit these kind of things that we need to change. The extensibility of free software is out. It, it's real. It's powerful. Um, and no proprietary software I've ever run across is, anything other than a headache. So I would say be knowledgeable about it and make the case. Um, and I don't, I don't know, it's, it has to ha happen one conversation at the, at the time. Um, but it, I, I mean, I have been able to convince a lot of people to use free software. Again, not because I'm like necessarily even a free software ideologue, but just because I know about this stuff and I know that it's better for basically every purpose. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's basically it. So you touched on it slightly before, but what are some big no-nos that everybody should avoid in pretty much every case? Like what, what are the biggest, let's call them leaks of data um, out there? Uh, I would say using any kind of cloud storage, that's like a really obvious thing. Um, there is like this convenience of using it and storing stuff on Dropbox or Google Drive or iCloud or whatever. Um, that is one of the big things um, that I think it, people think that it's it makes things easier to use. A lot of times it doesn't really. Um, and that, of course, you literally just have your, I don't know, you have a company that has very intimate access to a lot of your data. Um, that's a very obvious thing. Um, I would just say a lot of the times 
the, the issue is not even necessarily using proprietary software where there's a free software equivalent, but using proprietary software where you've just been advertised to use this service when you don't really need it. You've just gotten used to it. I think that's kind of the bigger problem. Um, but yeah, cloud storage is the biggest issue because you are quite literally just sending your data to some other dude's computer. Like that's what you're doing. It's just sitting there. Um, and you have no control over if they actually delete it or if they're looking at it or not. Uh, we, we talked about in the other episode, right? You know, Bentham's Panopticon, right? Where it, uh, there's a prison, the warden cannot be seen by any of the inmates, and he could be looking at any of them at any point in time. They don't know if he is. And it's the same thing with cloud storage. Like, you don't know if these people are looking at your data. They easily could. And that actually kind of keeps you in mind. Like, it, I, I run across a lot of people who say things like, well, Google already has everything of mine. Oh, my, it's, it's, no, it's no good. And frankly, back in, like, 2012 or something, that's how it was with me, you know? I was just like, I'm just going to put everything on Google Drive. I guess I get some convenience out of it. But just take it a step of a step at a time and you'll realize there's a reason like to have your own files on your own computer and to be able to do whatever you want with them be it, that actually open doors that you don't even realize like if, if you're on linux like the amount of like scripting and like uh iterating through folders and doing all this fancy stuff with my images because they are files on my computer just and you don't even know how to do that now if you're you know someone who's just new into unix or linux um but that it opens up a lot of doors that you don't even realize. So that's what I would say. And again, this is same thing you, you asked about, like, how do you talk to your boss about it? Extensibility, like free software, open standards, they make things easier. You can do more with them. Yeah, they take a little more time to familiarize yourself, although that's not always the case, frankly, but it just opens up a lot for you. Luke, thanks so much for coming on, man. It's been a great chat um, and you shared a lot of great info. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for having me on.